Hey there, this is Mr. Icarus, and welcome to yet another edition of Doom Mod Madness. This time round, we are checking out a total conversion by the name of Shrine 2. If you've not heard of Shrine before, fear not, I have indeed covered it in the past. And if you want the short and simple of how I thought of it, I thought it was very visually interesting, but it ultimately wound up being a little too short and a little too easy. If anything, the original shrine felt more like a prototype, a dry run, if you will, for something that would ultimately come later, and that feeling is certainly magnified when we come to regard Shrine 2 itself. So, what exactly is the story here? Well, fresh off the victory of the preceding mod, Shrine 2 has you locked up and stripped of your weaponry, but a helpful toss of your old bone blade from an unseen assistant helps you engineer a jailbreak. From here on in, it is largely a quest to track down those who have wronged you and flung the realms into chaos, of which there are many. This is a much bigger mod in comparison to the first, taking up a grand total of 32 maps if you include the secret ones, and also introduces a whole new fresh batch of weaponry and monsters with which to use them on. As for the weapons themselves, I would dare say that these are ever so slightly unconventional. Where you'd normally expect to be kitted out with the analog of a pistol as your first weapon, Shrine 2 introduces you instead to the pod bombs. The secondary function of this allows you to bounce them off surfaces where they will eventually explode after the timer runs out, but personally I've always found the primary to be a much more effective usage of it. This level will also introduce you to the Adjudicator, a weapon that operates on ice mana and provided you pelt enemies with enough projectiles from it, will freeze them and allow you to shatter them, which on the surface, very satisfying, but on another level, also turns out to be extremely useful because as it happens, freezing certain enemies prevents them from triggering effects after they die. A good example here would be the flesh bags, as I like to call them. Freezing them not only prevents them from emitting gas, which can damage you, but also prevents them from expelling tiny little creatures after they die that can nibble annoyingly at your ankles afterwards. Another enemy type that the Adjudicator turns out to be tremendously effective at dealing with would be these fellas with the crucifixes on their chest. Killing them with other weaponry usually just results in a decapitation, and yes, in most cases that would be fatal, but for these, that just means that they take a little bit of a rest on their back, eventually pop back up and start bothering you all over again. As you might imagine, the Adjudicator helpfully allows you to sidestep this particular scenario and ensures that it'll be a weapon you'll return to on multiple occasions throughout the course of the campaign. If there's something that I greatly appreciate about Shrine 2 is its eagerness to make you feel a little uncomfortable. Dare I say, even a little disgusted. And nowhere is that more apparent than later on in this level where you plunge into a fleshy burrow which is just icky enough as it is, and acquire the Hive Slayer. A wonderfully disgusting weapon that is powered by hivelings, and if you look closely enough on the side, you'll occasionally see a maggot traveling between its many orifices. Ugh, I mean, even saying it out loud just makes me shudder ever so slightly. But as for the weapon in practice, it is, for all intents and purposes, a machine gun. A machine gun that fires bugs and also features an alt fire that fires a bigger, fatter bug that can home in on nearby enemies. Following map introduces you to a few new foes, including this unnerving angel esque creature, and also the Gore Blaster, which I've just used to kill it. This is probably closest in relation to the Super Shotgun. Primary fire is a triple barrel blast accompanied by a rather satisfying spinning animation, while its secondary doles out weaker individual shots but at a much faster fire rate. I'd hesitate to say whether the secondary is more accurate than the primary, if I had to hazard a guess, I'd probably say yes. In either case, whatever method makes these god-awful abominations die quickest is best in my books. Eventually, the winding path of Chapter 1 will lead you to the Ritual Ward, and it's during the course of this map that some of Shrine 2's stylistic influences become much more readily apparent. It only took a few brief glimpses of this opening section here for me to be very much reminded of Bloodborne. Further to that, the Soulsborne influence would certainly go some way as to explain the inexplicably large number of smashable pods. 
It's worth noting, however, that the Soulsborne influence here does not extend to the structure of the levels themselves. Rather, you'll find that the vast majority of maps here in Shrine 2 are relatively simple and straightforward. The mod instead choosing to leverage its efforts much more in the direction of aesthetics and atmospherics. In regards to the latter, I'd say nowhere is that more keenly felt than in the usage of music. Each map here backed by a relatively low-key ambient track that nonetheless manages to dredge up significant feelings of unease. The sense that, if it weren't already abundantly clear, that things have gone very, very wrong. But less of that. Here's a cross that allows you to smite the ever-loving shit out of your enemies. The Ritual Ward gives way to the Clockwork Cathedral, and after fighting through a horde of enemies and a bit of hop-skipping and jumping across some Castlevania-esque gears, you will find yourself in the company of Chapter 1's boss. Yep, it's an organ. Made of flesh. But of course it is. And yes, that is indeed a butthole orb that can fire explosives. As it happens, the object of this encounter is to destroy all of the orbs, which will then reveal the heart of the organ, which you then just thoroughly pummel with whatever ammunition you have to hand. If I'm gonna be honest, it's more visually interesting than it is mechanically interesting, but nonetheless, heck of a way to finish out the chapter. Our next destination is Elementium, where we swiftly learn how to use the Bone Blade to do a meta dash, as well as acquire ourselves an upgrade for the Adjudicator. What does it do? It fires faster, and also comes equipped with a nifty gauntlet that allows you to shoot your enemies into bits from afar. Opening level also introduces what I like to call a Fat Boy, which for all intents and purposes is a Mancubus with bouncing explosive rounds, and if anything, is most memorable to me for this. This towering pile of nope is known as the Lighthouse. Mercifully, it can't move, but it does emit a large number of projectiles, some of which will home in on your location, all the while emitting a haunting, borderline maddening noise throughout the entire area. Some of you who are more immersed in the horrific creations of the internet will note that the Lighthouse here bears more than a passing resemblance to Siren Head, and that is, of course, no coincidence. Either way, both of them have the effect of thoroughly rustling my jimmies, and the lighthouse here also takes a gargantuan amount of ammunition to put down. In summary, fuck that thing in particular. As the name may imply, the levels contained within the realm of Elementium usually feature a degree of environmental extreme, and the level Temple on the Ridge is distinctly chillier in comparison to the rest. Not only does it provide you ample opportunity to test out your Erdash, specifically to reach some rather useful secrets, but it also exposes yet another indispensable use of the Adjudicator. You see, it doesn't just freeze enemies, it also freezes liquids, allowing you to form platforms and cross potentially harmful environments. Just make sure you save some ice mana for the return trip, because, um, yeah, now I'm kind of buggered. As the lore of elemental theming goes, the following level is distinctly more lava-based, yet more opportunities to use that Erdash to snag yourself some useful power-ups, more on those later, but ultimately serves as a nice way to introduce you to the axe. This is oddly still labelled as the enhanced adjudicator here, I'm pretty sure that's not what it is, because this is quite possibly the opposite of the adjudicator. Where that spits ice, this spits hot fire. The axe itself actually functions in a fairly interesting fashion. Rather than requiring the collection of ammunition or mana, all it requires is for you to have it equipped for it to recharge its energy. If the energy falls below 50, it loses the ability to spit fire, but still delivers a fairly hefty up-close melee strike. If it hits zero, it has to perform a cooldown animation, or should that be called a warm-up animation. Either way, it will leave you open to attack without recourse for a small window of time, so yeah, despite the impressive damage dealing that you can do with this, it does occasionally help not to get too overzealous with it. Pro tip, while crossing this section towards the end of the level, try not to get too distracted by the environment or the overabundance of pickups on this particular platform, because I did that, and guess what I forgot to pick up? This thing. It's called the Bone Mortar. Apparently it fires raw angelic energy. Would have been really handy to have, because shortly after missing it, I had to fight this thing. 
Mercifully, it is still entirely doable without the bone mortar, it's just that that's the only pickup for the weapon in the entire game, and I didn't notice till I got to the start of the final chapter. Oh, it's dead. Ooh, a pickup, that's a real- Jesus Christ! You know, I think that's a first for me. A jump skirt by way of smashing crockery. I mean, how else are you supposed to announce the fact that your boss has two phases? By the way, if you happen to notice an unceasing stream of heavenly fire emanating from your crotch, I would advise you seek out your nearest medical professional, ASAP. Believe it or not though, that boss does not signify the end of this particular chapter. That is instead reserved for a few levels down the line where you come face to face with the Horseman, a boss that I completely visually misidentified at first because I thought it was like a camel type creature with a sentient hump. Don't tell me that's not what it looks like. As for the fight itself, eh, it's alright. It calls in some support with some gunners from around the arena, but most of them seem to end up shooting at the boss rather than in my general direction. And once you get to the halfway phase, they all die anyway, as the horseman dismounts, kills his steed, and then decides to get serious. In this particular context, serious boils down to projectiles. Many more projectiles. And secretly, I was kind of hoping for more of a sword dashing kind of encounter, but no, Toho style projectile dodging is still a okay with me. Eventually, the horseman bites the dust, and that marks the end of Elementium. Where to next? The Angelic Realm. Of course! Here, you will fight literal dickheads and Good grief, do these take forever to kill. Mercifully, you get to break it up a bit by dealing with a few seraphim floating around the place, but after that, it is back to dickhead bashing. Two hours later. This is mandatory, by the way. You're not allowed to exit this level until you've killed this dickhead knight, and... Oh boy, there have to be better ways of making the player expend their ammunition. Why did it have to be a bullet sponge? Because... Oh god, this is dull. Mercifully, that map is not indicative of this chapter as a whole, and its one saving grace is the fact that finishing it grants you access to a staff that can summon demon doggos. Now I know what you're thinking. Can you pet the demon dogs? Get back here! Get back here! Why won't you let me love you? God damn it! Oh, there you go. Yes. Yes, you can. At some point during this chapter, you'll also be able to get your hands on dual-wielded gore blasters. The benefit of which being the goddamn dual-wielded gore blasters. It's like wielding two super shotguns at the same time, which you can then rapid fire. The downside to that, however, is each primary shot consumes 10 points of ammunition. So, if I had to offer advice, I'd say save it for the big boys. You may also notice that this is an upgraded cross. This is something that runs on a similar fashion to the upgraded adjudicator. More crosses, more power, more smiting. Speaking of crosses, it's well worth mentioning at this point, one of the more numerous power-ups that you'll come across during the course of Shrine 2, and that would be this upturned crucifix. Activating this will give you a significant power boost and will allow you to deal much more hefty degrees of damage with any given weapon. And just to give you an idea of how effective using this power-up can be, this encounter versus a dickhead knight now takes an order of magnitude less time and less ammunition. Praise be! The end of the chapter has you face off against a, um, uh, a very aggressive series of hula hoops. Anyway, the hula hoops turn into a lady who's angry and very aflame. Anyway, the moral of this story is use the speed power up and then you can shoot bugs at an accelerated rate into her face and then angry lady goes away. There you go, that's that's the strat. That's the strat. Welcome to hell, the next stop on our journey. And if you think this meat hallway looks suspect, then you should see the rest of the place. Oh god. Mercifully, there are actually some enemies for you to fight down here amidst the literal field of dicks. And this map has the honor of introducing my least favorite enemy type next to the dickhead knights, the Brazen. Mercifully, there's only one of them here, but that doesn't stop it from being any less annoying. It's got a crap ton of health, which means it takes absolutely forever to kill. It seems to have a shifting pattern of fireball volleys, meaning that you're never entirely sure when you should be dodging at first. And I, I, I just hate it. It's a pain in the ass. Make it go away. Someone, please. If you're wondering what the name of the map is, it's quite fitting, really. Lust. 
and in my opinion probably one of the more memorable ones in the hell chapter as a whole it's just got this vibe and i'm not just talking about the visuals this section right here is probably going to be hell for tripophobes but it's got this woozy atmosphere that again i feel is very much credit to the soundtrack layered on top as for the suspicious liquids cascading from the orifices on the walls i'm guessing you think you know what it is but riddle me this is what you think it is normally acidic Lust will also grant you access to the blood rail. It's basically a railgun. Charge is required to make it as effective as possible, and if I had one criticism, I'd say that it could stand to be more disgusting. I want those guts to writhe as I charge it, damn it. Lust gives way to gluttony, but the more inquisitive among you may find an alternate route via a secret level. Part of the reason why I was able to acquire a weapon such as the Eldritch Annihilator. This puppy is powered by any kind of ammunition that you pick up, each pickup supplying you with an extra 5 points of power, and just generally pukes hot liquid death all over your enemies. It has the general effect of utterly trivializing most encounters, so for the most part I'd reserve it for situations where you feel like you're genuinely struggling, which is certainly going to be more the case on higher difficulties. The next few levels here in Hell are a little wobbly, but that's because they're still actively being workshopped by the authors of Shrine 2. For the most part, they are centered around the gimmick of using the Adjudicator to form safe platforms that'll allow you to safely traverse across the poisonous waters. It's a little long in the tooth in terms of how far you're asked to traverse, and if you rapid fire your mana the entire time, it's entirely likely that you can find yourself running out, so I'd say if you want advice for the current build of this, I'd say tap fire those platforms rather than full autoing them. As for the boss fight that caps off the hell chapter, it's interesting, but mainly for the fact that you don't actively participate in it. Instead, you're asked to defend five domineeresses atop their pillars as they pelt Dagon to death in the background. As an encounter, it feels oddly alienating, because you're just busy running around the base of these pillars, and then eventually Dagon kicks the bucket and you just carry on with your day. I can't help but feel that it might benefit from just a smidge more active participation from the player. Have the Domineeresses lowering a shield, for example, where you can then deliver a killing blow. Just something to make you feel a little bit more involved. If I could use a single phrase to describe the final chapter of Shrine 2, it would be, shit's weird. Actually, wait, that could be used to explain the entire mod. God damn it. In any case, I'd say use this opportunity to seek out one of the more, let's say, bullshit varieties of secret that are littered throughout the course of Shrine 2, and that would be the soul secret. You kind of need to know that these even exist to begin with to even attempt to reach them, but if you do, you will typically find them stuffed to the gills with tremendously useful items. The most useful of all, in my opinion, would be the Augur of Orphanum. If the crucifix could be described as supercharging your weapons, then the Augur ubercharges them. Highly recommended if you're in the mood for bullying a lighthouse or any other potentially troublesome enemy. God damn it, I should have led with the bone mortar. That thing is apocalyptic. When it comes to the rest of this chapter, we've got a visit to a spooky carnival, a train ride that is faintly reminiscent of blood, then it's a trip across the frigid sea until we finally reach the shores of Innsmouth. Lovely place, shame about the ever so slightly hostile locals, but then again, can you blame them when they're under the influence of a mad eldritch deity? Now listen here, Azathoth, you've been a very naughty boy. I don't care what you get up to in your featureless black void, but when it comes to fucking with the five realms, you got a whooping coming. Can you hear me? Are you even listening? Oh jeez, yes, yes you are. As far as final bosses go, I'd say that this is pretty good. This is definitely my favorite out of all of them here in Shrine 2. And that's because it's just really nicely structured. As you'd probably expect, it's got multiple phases, though each one of them features a different style of attack that you'll need to deal with. The first, you get Hadoukens thrown in your general direction, whereas this second Berserker phase has him charging in your general direction, delivering literal shotgun blasts punches if he catches up with you. Third phase is Mage Form, where he delivers a lot of homing projectile attacks, and I just decided I wasn't even going to give him a chance, so I popped every power-up I had, including, of course, the time stop. And this makes the phase a lot easier to deal with, 
It's nice when you can just pummel them to absolute oblivion, but guess what? There's a fourth phase. Of course! In any case, pummel it with everything you have. Then pummel it some more. And then continue pummeling. But there you go. That is how you defeat an ancient eldritch deity that resides at the center of all space, time, and reality. Uh, yeah. Good job. Time to go to the pub. So, what's the verdict? Well, it is certainly an improvement over the original, that's for sure. A lot of my criticisms thoroughly addressed. Too short, he has 30-something levels. Too easy, he has a range of difficulty. And God forbid if you bump it up for shits and giggles, because yes, it will kick your ass. Weapon variety is really nice, goes hand in hand with the monster variety. And crucially, it feels like each weapon here has a role to fulfill. There's a good situation to whip them out for. The Adjudicator probably the shining star example of that, what with its freeze function and the enemies that are actively easier to deal with when you use it. And the weapons themselves just feel nicely balanced in terms of power versus ammo capacity. The dual gore blasters, for example, those are OP. There's no two ways about it, but the amount of ammo that's hoovered up by using them means you're not going to be using them for too long before you're going to have to switch to something else. In terms of elements here in Shrine 2 that could potentially do with a little bit more spit and polish, I'm a little conflicted when it comes to the complexity of the level design. I feel like on one front it's probably a little too simple, but then I feel like it works in service of helping accentuate the atmosphere. You're not too busy getting lost, you're instead just soaking up the vibe. I don't know, it's a sliding scale. I mean, for sure, there's a few levels here that could certainly do with a rework, specifically thinking of levels such as that first entry in the Realm of Angels, and maybe that trip down the River Styx where you can potentially run out of ice mana, but for the most part, what's here is A-OK. -okay. If I have but one request for Shrine 3, it would be more disgusting biomechanical weaponry, please. I didn't know that was a thing that I needed in my life, but apparently it is. In any case, I would certainly recommend Shrine 2. If you fancy a strange and twisted journey through corrupted realms, then this, I guess, is going to be right up your alley. In which case, the link, as usual, can be found in the description below. While I'm at it, I'd like to give a great big thank you to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon. Thank you so very much for supporting the channel and for helping to make content like this possible. If you're interested in lending a hand yourself, maybe you'd like to see your name in the credits, maybe you'd like to gain early access to my videos before anyone else. Well, if that's the case, you'll find the link to my Patreon page also in the description below. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video, feel free to let me know what you thought in the comments, and feel free to suggest any mod you'd like to see me cover in future editions of Doom Mod Madness. This has been Mr. Icarus, thank you very much for watching, Icarus out.